foreign policy and defense correspondent at the Financial Times to introduce our distinguished team. Having served five years as the FT's East Africa correspondent based in Nairobi, in addition to reporting on all aspects of U.S. foreign policy now, uh, I can't think of anyone who's better placed to guide today's conversation. So Katrina, over to you. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Fred, and welcome all of you watching live. And of course, welcome to Uhuru Kenyatta, Mr. President. We are absolutely delighted to have you with us today. And we're, we're thrilled to say we've got a lot to cover. Um, so I hope you won't mind, uh, Mr. President, if I uh, sweep you through a range of subjects and forgive me if ever I interrupt. Um, I'm only trying to make sure that we hear as much from you as possible on as much as possible. Perhaps I no should... problem. Looking forward to it. <laughs> Thank you. And it's good to see you again. I think I'm looking saw... forward to a good discussion. <laughs> I think I last saw you in 2015. And today I see you, Mr. President, in the middle of a nail biter. Uh, you had the first round of voting at the UN Security Council yesterday. And presumably to your disappointment, it's gone to a second round. And you're up against your, your very own regional neighbor, Djibouti, for uh, a temporary seat at the UN Security Council. So Please, here, make your pitch. Why, why should UN Security Council members elect Kenya today? Well, let me first and foremost begin by uh, saying and joining you in welcoming everybody who's participating with us. And going straight to the point, and in order to save time, just to say that Kenya, for over 55-odd uh, years of independence, has consistently been engaged in trying to participate with global partners to bring peace and stability in distant parts of the world. Kenya is a known safe haven and has been known as a safe haven for refugees from the Rwanda crisis to the Uganda crisis to the Ethiopian crisis to Somalia and to so many different parts of the world where we have sent our peacekeeping troops. We see ourselves as a bridge and as a person able to bring people around the table, you know very well that the Sudanese peace process was done here in Nairobi. It was under Kenya's initiative. In fact, uh, uh, um, the peace process that led to the independence in Sudan, a little bit that since then we have had serious problems, was started in Nairobi. The process that started the first democratic uh, processes in Somalia, happened here in Nairobi. So I think we are, are, are a safe pair of hands who try to act as neutral as possible, but always encouraging peace, stability, and progress. And that is what we are known for in a region of instability. And this is what we want to offer to the world. Whose support do you need to try and clinch the vital second round today? And, and why do you think it uh, is so split between uh, two regional countries? Well, let me begin by saying that uh, the split is not so much based on any ideological difference. The split is based on the fact that we ourselves on the continent, unfortunately through uh, bilateral arrangements, uh, um, uh, conceded in previous uh, elections, and uh, consequently, when this uh, turn came around, um, our friends in Djibouti thought because they had surrendered their turn to somebody else, they should be given the opportunity. We ourselves felt that uh, it was our turn, and legitimately so, and uh, bilateral negotiations should not interfere with uh, our AU protocols, and our AU protocols are, you go to the African Union, you are I, you're endorsed as the African candidate. What happened the previous year, if somebody surrendered their seat in favor of somebody else, those were bilateral arrangements. And, and, and our argument has been, let us follow the laid down procedures. And the laid down procedures is that it is the African Union that endorses a candidate. And it was the African Union that endorsed Kenya. And my hope and prayer 
is that ultimately we will see ourselves through this and then be able to focus ourselves on the matters that really matter, which is peace in Somalia, which is involving ourselves in, in, in uh, as far as our region is concerned, in um, um, supporting the young government in South Sudan, it is uh, uh, working with our neighbors in Sudan, it is fighting terrorism, which is uh, uh, a, a fact of life that has affected us, and most importantly, right now, a fact that's facing us across the globe, which is COVID-19. These are the areas and these are the focuses that I believe we should be paying attention to. And I do hope that after today's uh, election, and this is my hope, this is my prayer, that we shall now be able to regroup, come back together and focus ourselves on the issues that matter. I'm, I'm hearing that obviously both you and Djibouti have huge stakes in the security uh, evolving in, in Somalia. Um, do you want this post so much that you'd be prepared to share it with Djibouti? Uh, I, 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 I don't want to be dragged into that uh, particular situation because, like I said, we are the African Union endorsed candidate. We are moving in accordance with all the rules and obligations of the African Union. And my hope and prayer is that we shall be able to come together and move in, in the right direction. And Djibouti will also have her chance. So we are just saying, I don't want to preempt anything. I am just saying, Let's get over this hurdle. Let's pull together. Let's march forward. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, let's stick with the news. And I should say to everyone watching, please send in questions using the Q&A uh, function <coughs> to, to, to rattle through them and make sure that we put as much as possible to the president. Uh, but sticking with the news, you mentioned coronavirus. You're fighting a, an extraordinary situation as many countries in the world are at the moment. Um, your growth has already taken a hit in terms of predictions. It's been consistently above 5% for, for years. It's looking at being more like 1% now. You don't actually have that many cases. I think you have more than 4,000, uh, more than 100 deaths, but I know you had uh, a high yesterday of 180. So I know it's a great concern. And of course, you're trying to tackle uh, the economic ramifications uh, at, at a Kenyan level, at a continental level and attended yesterday the China-Africa Summit on coronavirus. So please, what was China's pitch to you and are they going to give you debt relief? Well, let's uh, first and foremost start <clears throat> by recognizing that uh, coronavirus is, 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 is mainly a health issue and our key focus is ensuring that we keep our people safe. So far in Kenya, we've had about some uh, 4,000, let's say 4,250, 4,300 cases. I don't know the exact number right now, with about 117 fatalities. Uh, not as high as uh, we have seen in other parts of the world, but all the same, it is uh, uh, a crisis of concern. It is a crisis of concern because. Um, uh, of the manner in which especially it is affecting our, 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 our older populations. So we are focused ourselves first and foremost on dealing with the health crisis. But exactly as you've said, this is also an economic crisis. It's an economic crisis because it has resulted in some key sectors of our economy being hugely affected by lockdowns. Um, we were forced, for example, to close our airspace down. This affected our tourism sector. You know very well, having lived in Kenya, that tourism is a very a, a, a critical part of our economy. It also affected, uh, to a certain degree, our horticultural sector, which again, as you know, horticulture and floriculture is also uh, critical to our economy. So we're dealing with both a health problem on the one hand and trying to balance that with ensuring that we are also able to keep our, 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 our economy at a, a, afloat. So we are focused especially on ensuring that we have various stimulus programs that we are pushing through. We are focusing on the health, like I said, uh, working with our county governments in terms of ensuring readiness, preparedness, in terms of isolation beds, in terms of ventilators, in terms of getting information out as to the need for masks, social distancing and so on and so forth, while at the same time trying to balance that with keeping critical sectors of our economy uh, up and running. So what does this mean? Going back to your next question, 
This means that without a doubt, Kenya, like many African and global countries, we're also under fiscal pressure. We need fiscal space in order to be able to, to, to re-engage. It comes at a time when we, as a country, were focusing on some very serious austerity measures aimed at trying to reduce our deficit. Now, here we are all of a sudden faced with this challenge, and we have to find additional fiscal space in order to have these various stimulus programs that we have uh, underway. What is critical to those stimulus programs? What is critical for us to be able to find that fiscal space? We are telling the international community, we are telling our development partners, and that's not Kenya. That's the position of the African Union, that at this critical moment, we need you to be able to give us that room by giving us and extending uh, 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 some of the loans that are coming up in order to be able to give us that fiscal room to be able to, be, to deal with the channel challenges that have been brought on board by Corona. It's a cogent argument, Mr. President, and you've been making it for quite a while now. What are they, what are they saying in response to the pleas that you've been putting out? And, and what did happen at the China-Africa Summit yesterday? Do you feel that China is going to uh, work with you and other African countries on, on debt relief? I know that Kenya's debt alone stands at now about 60% of GDP. The IMF is beginning to issue warnings. You've gone from low to, to moderate to high risk of debt distress in a, in a matter of mere years. Um, China was very clear. And uh, let me first of all go back to uh, the position that we were articulating to the G20. And our position to the G20, which was all the developed countries, all our development partners, that Africa needs space. After the uh, uh, last G20 meeting, there was an agreement. There was an agreement that uh, we would be given um, a leeway up to the end of the year, uh, a grace period, so to say, uh, up to the end of the year. China, in our meeting, the Africa-China meeting yesterday, endorsed that position and said that they would support it. But we are saying that that still hasn't gone far enough. So we are appealing to China in the same way as a member of the G20, that we want this extended. And yesterday's meeting, they said that they would be willing to look into it in conjunction with the other partners, because what they're saying is that there shouldn't be a China specific um, uh, position unless it's something that is agreed on bilaterally. But this is a global problem and should be handled by all our development partners and all of us coming together, and that's Africa's position actually, that we should all come together and have a co common position as to how to deal with this issue. Because uh, it, it, it's, it's different for different countries. For the less developed countries, and there are some who are, uh, I know you're mentioning Kenya as being labeled high, Others have been pushed to the category of basically unsustainable or uh, can't meet. So there are some on the continent who are saying they actually want debt relief. We who are in the lower middle income bracket are saying we just want fiscal space. We just want time to get our economy up and running again. So what we're saying is that we need this dialogue, but we are saying we would prefer if we dealt together as a continent. And I think that's the position even the UN Secretary General has taken. That's the position the IMF is also taking. That's the position I believe the World Bank is taking. That's the position that a number of European countries are taking. And what we're saying is we need each other. We need to be able to look at the challenges uh, that are facing us and have a common position as to how to deal with it. Because at the end of the day, if the global economy collapses, it's not going to affect any individual country. It's going to affect us all. So this, this is going mechanism, to require all of us pooling together. This mechanism sounds complicated to evolve. I know there's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation. The G20 doesn't want to uh, give, give uh, help on debt if it's just going to go to China. China doesn't want to give help on debt if it's just going to go to everybody else. How are you actually going to move this forward and accommodate both LDCs and, as you say, Kenya, uh, a middle-income country which actually isn't affected by the current G20 outreach? 
Well, this is exactly what we're saying. And that's why we're saying that, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that this crisis comes at a time when uh, there are so many different global uh, attentions, different trade wars going on. You know exactly what I'm talking about. All we are saying, and this is Kenya and Africa, all we are saying is that let's not be sucked back into uh, isolationism. Let us not be sucked back into uh, um, unilateralism. We need each other today more than we ever did. And we need to be able to come together and realize that success will be success for all of us. We're not going to fight Corona, for example, if one country fails and another succeeds. We, we must succeed together. This is one of those stories where it's a win-win for everybody. There, there can't be one who fails and others who win because the one who fails will come back and infect all of us. Equally, the economy has to work for all of us. So I, I think our position has always been, we are trying to say, let's focus ourselves on those issues that matter. And what matters today is lives. What matters today is common prosperity and stability. And that's not going to come from any one country. It's not going to come from China alone. It's not gonna come from the United States alone. It's not gonna come from Europe alone. It needs all of us coming together to be able to find a solution. And that's Africa's position and that's Kenya's position. Um, I, I want to just, since you've mentioned coronavirus and the difficult decisions you've had to make, I, I've seen some questions coming in. Um, there have obviously been a, uh, you've imposed a very rigid curfew. It was 7 p.m. for a while. You, you've loosened it to 9 p.m. now. But there have been a series of incidents and allegations about police brutality. And one of the questions we've had come in from, from the public is, has the Black Lives Matter movement uh, that is in the world uh, uh, affected your sense of policing in your own country? And will you look at any kind of reform to policing in Kenya as you uh, look at the impact of coronavirus? Un un undoubtedly. And in fact, I'll tell you that this is something that we've already started. This is something that we have already started, even under our new constitution. And we are trying to ensure that all the necessary oversight uh, bodies that have been charged with the responsibility of uh, overseeing our police forces are empowered to the degree that they are now able to take action. And uh, we, we have a number of cases already where our oversight authorities have actually taken action against police officers. I will admit we are not 100% there yet. I don't think there's any country in the world that is 100% there yet. But we do acknowledge that there must be a situation where policing and communities are brought much closer together than they have been in the past. And I think what we have seen and witnessed in America is only making that reality that much sharper, that we have to acknowledge that policing and community must be brought closer together. And these are lessons that we are learning. These are part and parcel of what we are. We've going, we're going through a whole new curriculum change in terms of uh, a training of our officers, even retraining existing officers. And all of this is actually aimed at improving the relationship between our police services, because we must police, and the communities within which they serve. Thank you. I wanted to come back to your point about um, arguing against unilateralism as you face this um, global crisis. And you're obviously caught because the U.S. itself is very alarmed at China's interest and footprint in, in Africa as a whole. And obviously China is a, a huge lender and uh, has a huge presence in, in Kenya and beyond. How are you seeing um, this battle are you caught or are you being are you finding an opportunity to encourage the u.s to do more u.s investment in africa has traditionally been extremely small uh, but we know that chinese investment comes with many complications are you getting cold feet about china i'm not getting cold feet about anybody i am just saying that as i have started by saying we all need each other Fred will bear testament. Um, this is not my first engagement with the Atlantic Council. And I have always uh, maintained the same position. 
there is opportunity on the African continent. China has taken advantage of that opportunity. The West has really been focused and were focused more on themselves. And I have always said these opportunities that China is seeing on the African continent are also equally available to our American partners. I have given numerous examples of American companies who have actually come in and found a space and a niche in Kenya, in Africa. And all we have been saying is we want to encourage more of this. And to be honest, the, the very first session actually I had with the Trump administration uh, uh, when I came there a couple of years ago was centered on that because exactly the same question that you were asking, they were asking. And I was saying, well, look, um, the United States must equally, just as China is equally supporting their companies, you've got to support your companies. And I was very happy as a result of that. And as, I think as a result of other engagements with other African countries, when they announced that they would be coming up with support for American companies that wanted to do business in Kenya. And as a result, we've started to see an increased level of interest. And we have said, we are colorblind. Let me, I think that's the best way to put it. We are colorblind, right? We know that there are opportunities. And what we're saying is, here we are. We're open to doing business with the world. We are not specifically targeting one part of the world against another. All we're saying is, we are ready. We are open for business. Come, join hands with us, partner with us. There are great opportunities that are available in Africa. There is a young population that is dying for jobs. There is a young population that is in need of everything from toothpaste and toothbrushes to cars and technology. Welcome. I'm very happy, for example, recently, uh, uh, Google has partnered with uh, one of our telecoms in, uh, in, in, in Kenya through their loon program. And they're now bringing across uh, balloons which are going to enable that telecom to be able to have outreach to every single corner of the world. These are the opportunities that are available to you. Take advantage of them. Well, let's talk about this effort. So the US has uh, said it wants to strike a bilateral free trade agreement with you. Um, it's starting in sub-Saharan Africa with Kenya alone, even though you're a member of many regional uh, groupings. Um, you've had to defend yourself a little bit on those grounds, but you've said that this is about creating a model agreement for, for the rest of Africa. Can you tell me a little bit about how that's going to work and, and where you are in the negotiations? Because, um, yeah. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I want to say that exactly what you've said is, 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 is our position. Kenya has been a fighter for the Africa free trade uh, arrangement, a market of over a billion people. One of the biggest challenges that the African continent has faced is the fact that with 54 different countries, we're all very, very small markets. We have successfully negotiated an Africa free trade arrangement. When we met with the United States that was keen to start off negotiations, of which we were also keen to kick off trade negotiations between our two countries, we made it very clear that that negotiation would have to be done on the basis and without undermining the Africa free trade arrangement. Because our argument was that this free trade agreement must ultimately be able to benefit from that wider. And that's why, in fact, we delayed our discussions because we wanted the Africa free trade arrangement to kick in and come into force, which is coming, it's coming up in, uh, uh, I, I think it's the first week of July. Now, once that starts, our arrangements under the AFT tells us that we are in a position to enter into arrangements with third parties, and in this case, specifically for us in Kenya, it is going to be with the United States. So long as that trade arrangement that we have with the United States does not interfere with the Africa free trade arrangement. And that's why we actually delayed our discussions until 
the Africa Free Trade Arrangement came into play. And I believe this works not just for Kenya and Africa, but I also believe it works for the United States because it gives that wider market access. And secondly, like I'm saying, we are going to be able to go through all the preliminaries, which tomorrow could be copied and imitated by others. And, 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 and so what uh, we are seeing ourselves today, we're seeing ourselves as trailblazers. We're just saying we're just the first because we know many will come. We have Morocco that's been in there before. We've got South Africa that's been there before. But Kenya will be the first under the new Africa free trade arrangement. So we are going to be trailblazers in this. And we hope that others will also follow through. So th this is... Uh, the way we are looking at it from uh, Nairobi. Thank you. Well, let's try and drill down into some of that detail because this deal is not going to be some kind of a Goa style preferential trade deal. This is going to be a partnership of equals. And if you've read the US uh, Trade Representative Office uh, negotiating objective, uh, which they've, they've already laid out in a 20 page document, they're tough. They want duty-free access for U.S. apparel, the main thing that Kenya actually exports under AGOA from Kenya to the U.S. Uh, they want comprehensive market access uh, for agricultural goods. At the moment, the U.S. exports wheat to Kenya. Uh, you're an agricultural uh, nation. How are you going to work this. And we know that in bilateral trade deals, it's very often the less powerful country uh, that comes off worse and you're up against a superpower. Well, um, we're not looking at it from that perspective. We believe that all trade negotiations are based on a win-win. And we believe that that is the intention of the United States just as much as it is our intention. We do agree we are also talking about a much larger economy than ours. We are acknowledging we're talking about a much larger population than ours. But ultimately, the whole objective, even of AGOA, and, 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 and we are led to believe that over time anyway, and this is a fact because we knew AGOA was going to come to an end at some stage. Right? We, we have encouraged it and we appreciate all the administrations that have extended and extended, but it has always been made clear that a goal would come to an end. That was a process of allowing us to get our basic infrastructure in place, getting uh, access to markets, understanding markets and etc. So we are going to be faced at one stage or another with a position where we must negotiate. And uh, I don't believe it is in America's interest to dominate discussions or to dominate trade, because if trade is not going to be two ways, it's not in their interest, it's not in our interest. So I strongly believe that uh, we have a very strong negotiation team that is also uh, a, a, a set foot uh, forth their terms. What is encouraging is actually the willingness uh, and I believe the willingness of the United States and, 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 and this I saw not only with my uh, discussions in, uh, in January with the administration, but I also saw it in our discussions with uh, uh, Congress and the Senate, because I also went to talk to them, that ultimately we are trying to find a scenario that, yes, indeed, opens up Kenya as a market to some American products as well, but also enables Kenyans to take advantage of a huge American market. So ultimately, uh, the, the basis of our negotiations must be that there must be a win-win. There are areas I believe that America will be dominant. In areas of, 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 of technology, for example, and, and uh, probably healthcare and other such areas. But there are also other areas that I believe that uh, American market access can help our, also, our economy uh, 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 grow to a certain degree. And ultimately, what is the essence of an FTA? The essence of an FTA is investment. Ultimately, I believe Americans themselves will be able to say, well, why can't we just invest in Kenya and not only um, take advantage 
of Kenya, but the region, but also of other markets in other parts of the world where Kenya has uh, an advantage. So I go back to my point. Trade negotiations are not about winner takes all. Trade negotiations are about everybody must leave the table and feel that they're a winner. Thank you. Well, let's talk about investment and whether this trade deal will lead to greater investment. Um, the economists I speak to explain that the only way that Kenya can really maximize investment from, from a free trade deal such as this is to bring over U.S. investment to do value added, agro processing, that, that sort of thing. But who would be your market for that? Would you be exporting back to the U.S.? C clearly, that would be unlikely. You would be exporting, presumably, to uh, the region, even as far as to Nigeria. And the U.S. certainly sees Kenya as a gateway to Africa. C can you talk to us a little bit about if that's the case and how you reassure your own neighbors um, that this is an opportunity that they will benefit from rather than becoming a market for a, for a U.S. trade uh, investment deal? We, 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 we have similar situations. Uh, I'm sure you're, you're, you're fair, uh, aware of the, the, the scenario, for example, that we have as the African, Caribbean, Pacific with the European Union, which now uh, uh, at the uh, expiry of Cotonou, we have now re-engaged under EPAS, right? And uh, it is a, a similar sort of situation where we have market access for uh, 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 certain commodities into, into Europe, uh, tariff-free, but they also have access into our own markets, uh, also uh, 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 tariff-free. And this is the important thing for me, as far as I'm concerned, when we, when we talk about the Africa Free Trade Arrangement. What has made a lot of these kind of negotiations very difficult is because of all the many borders and all the many uh, uh, um, uh, non-tariff barriers that existed with trade between African countries. Now, with, with the Africa free trade arrangement coming on, play, on board, a lot of these are going to, to be removed. So it's going to make not just Kenya, but Africa that much more attractive. And that's why I keep saying that what I see uh, uh, Kenya being is basically a trailblazer. We, we're not just going to be a dumping ground for goods. We're also going to be a manufacturer of goods. And we're not also saying that Kenya will be manufacturing everything. Some of this manufacturing capacity, we also might not even be able to handle. We will need partnerships with Tanzania, with Uganda, with Rwanda, with all our partners making different parts. Look at uh, uh, um, Airbus. Let me use that as the perfect example, right? The Airbus Consortium is a consortium of five, six different countries, all working and partnering together, and they have made that a European giant that is now face-to-face uh, 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 um, -face with Boeing. So um, these are the opportunities that I see, and I am not just necessarily looking at it from the Kenyan perspective, but I'm just saying how these different parts can actually benefit not just our region here in East Africa, but the entire African continent by pulling us together, working together, creating larger markets, and also ultimately having markets outside of the African continent. Thank you. Well, um, I understand your, your team has very kindly said you're able to speak for just a little bit longer. So I'm obviously not asking tough enough questions, but I'm very grateful to explain a little bit more of your time. Um, I'm going to pass over to our senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, Aubrey Ruby. But I do want to just offer one question from, from the members of the public that have come in, which is, uh, which is your favorite, Tusker or White Cap? Uh, without a doubt, Tusker goes first, but don't tell Kenya Breweries that. <laughs> um, and we also have a question about um, uh, Black Lives Matter here, which is asking, what is your message to the people in America who are protesting uh, in defense of human rights? Well, we ourselves are very, 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 very clear. All lives matter. But we are also equally clear that there should be no targeted uh, 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 um, oppression of any group in society. And I want to give you an example. We ourselves 
we may not have uh, uh, black versus white or, 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 or white oppression, but we, 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 you, you're familiar with the scenario Kenya saw itself in in 2007 as a result of the ethnic clashes that we had. We can't afford to have anybody feeling that they have been left out or left behind. So ours is really just to encourage all our partners across the globe. We have seen the problems when communities clash with each other. We have seen what it costs. We need one another. So be it two different ethnic groups clashing or two communities of different color clashing, all of this, we must be able to understand that we have to live together. And that actually is at the heart of what we are working on in Kenya under the BBI arrangement, where we want to say that there is no community that is greater, superior, or better than the other. We are all Kenyans, and we must all be treated equally under the law and under the constitution. And that is the only thing I will tell our friends in America, let's do that. Let's just make sure that the law is observed and the law is equal to all, regardless of class, race, ethnicity, the law must apply equally. You can't be overhanded or heavy handed on one segment against another. That never works and that can never create stability or peace. So if we want to do that, I think it's time for everybody to recognize, and that's what we have recognized in Kenya, that we need each other and we must work together. Well, let me ask about the Building Bridges Initiative. We've had a number of questions come in on it from members of the public. And I know that the report is now out and that this comes from, for those of you who don't know, a historic handshake with um, your long-term opposition, uh, Raila Odinga. And I'd like to take the opportunity to ask um, a question that some skeptics have posed to me, which is what the overarching aim will be and what the structure of Kenyan society will look like once you go through this process. And one thing that has been put to me that I think will be very useful for, for you to comment on is whether um, if there were to be a referendum or any kind of constitutional change, and I know you've said you're agnostic on, on exactly what form it takes, but there are some people who are concerned that you might, quote, do a, do a Putin and uh, potentially stay on in a, in a role after you uh, leave the presidency. Can you rule out for us today that in a few years' time, I, I won't be calling you Mr. President or even Mr. Prime Minister? Well, I will, I will put it to you this way. Let me just go first and foremost to the base question. And the base question is, what is the outcome that we all hope to see? The primary reason for the Building Bridges Initiative, since our multi-party politics, we have always had tensions at every election cycle, tensions that were ethnic-based. And when we came together with Raila Odinga, the whole objective was to say that as a country, despite the fact that we have a new constitutional dispensation, we must ensure that future generations, our children, are not necessarily going to be faced with the kind of thing that we have seen. We want to transform our politics and make our politics that much more inclusive. And by inclusivity, we said, let us look at what are the issues, what are the crises that make these things happen. And that, those were the, that was the whole point of the BBI review across the country. Let's go through these points. Let's hear from the Kenyans themselves. Why do you always feel that an election must bring tension? And many things came out, you know, the feeling that if one community uh, won and another was left out, people would feel, you know, they feel like, okay, this is not our government, it's their government. So how do we deal with that? How do we make sure that government is that much more inclusive? How do we deal with, uh, we now have this devolved uh, a, a, a system, but people sometimes may be feeling that they are not really getting the full impact of that devolution. So how can we empower uh, those in devolved places more? The next issue was, you know, we have cross-border communities. How can we uh, 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 
uh, um, work regionally so that, uh, you know, especially all these communities, be it on the Somali border, the, the, the Ugandan border, the Tanzanian border and others, you know, how, how do we make them feel that, that uh, they're, they're not split, they're, they, they don't have split loyalties, so to say. So these are amongst many numerous issues that came about. And the whole focus of that, and again, very much in tandem, because even the framers of our 2010 constitution also recognized that after 10 years, there may be need to relook at this constitution because uh, constitutions are not necessarily written in stone. They are written to keep society moving and blending together, may need review. Whereas many chapters are absolutely excellent and Kenyans have seen great benefit. There may be some areas that we may need to review. And that's the reason for the referendum. So it is unfortunate that some have interpreted the, 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 the scenario of, of, of uh, a referendum to change the constitution to mean that certain individuals want to change that constitution to extend the presidential term. I can tell you, if there is one thing that Kenyans are very, very clear about, very clear about, is the two-term limit. The two-term limit Kenyans are very clear about, and they've been clear about since 1992 when we introduced multipartyism. And there's been no single president that has broken that. And I don't intend to be the first. Does that mean you rule out uh, the, the premiership? I have no clue whether there is going to be a premiership in the constitution. You see, these are the questions that people are now posing. I, what I told you is, the, the, I, I gave you a very clear synopsis of the areas where people are interested in. They're interested in the value of their vote. They're interested in the distribution of resources. They're interested in inclusivity in government. I have not heard of any of these other issues. And that is why I, I can't comment about what, as far as I am concerned, yeah, are not been a principal issue of the, of the whole uh, Building Bridges uh, 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 initiative. The, 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 the purpose is not there. All I can say is that the office that exists today is the office of the president, the president of the Republic of Kenya. Our constitution is very clear that a president serves for two terms, two terms. I am in now my second term. No president has broken that. I don't intend to do it. Well, thank you so much, Mr. President. It's been nice <laughs> to speak to you. I'm going to hand over for one last question to Aubrey Ruby, but I really appreciate uh, everything that we've managed to cover today. And thank you very much from me. Over to Aubrey. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, when are you coming back to Nairobi? Anytime, immediately. <laughs> You're most welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President, for taking the time. Um, my question has to do with uh, the economic recovery effort underway, particularly in the area of youth employment. Uh, we know that the informal sector, the Juakali, is quite large in Kenya and has constituted probably 90% of job creation. That's where people get their livelihoods. So how are you going to regenerate opportunity for the informal sector and in particular for youth? And then lastly, what's giving you hope during this time? Uh, it's definitely a difficult time for so many leaders. So what's giving you hope? Well, first and foremost, you're 100% you're, you're correct. And I have always insisted this, that uh, our Juakali sector, our informal sector, is the backbone of Kenya's economy. It is our small traders. It is our small business people. It is our hawkers on the street. They are the backbone of Kenya's economy. And undoubtedly, uh, as a result of COVID, they are the ones who uh, are most hurt because... Their, their income is more or less daily based. It's not, it's, it's not a salaried uh, 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 wage uh, like, 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 like those in the formal economy. Theirs, they earn day to day. 
And this was one of the reasons why critical to uh, our, our stimulus package was uh, the introduction of what we are calling Kazi Mitani, which is creating uh, um, civil works, uh, especially in our urban areas, where we could now engage. Um, I lost you there. I don't know what has happened. Oh, um, can, you, can you hear me? We still have you. Very glad. Oh, OK, I see you. I see you back again. Thank you. Uh, where we could engage them in civil works in terms of uh, 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 cleaning their estates, uh, doing up drainage. Furthermore, we also uh, sharply increased our cash transfer to vulnerable families uh, in order to ensure that especially this group of people was not ultimately left out. So this has been, and, 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 and we are currently dispersing anywhere between three and five million dollars a week to ensure that our, 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 our informal sectors, at least, are, they may not be able to have their regular jobs, but at least are still able to, to, to stay afloat as we move towards reopening of our economy. In terms of opportunities, the key areas that we're targeting, especially amongst our youth, and that's why we've even gone through with our new education curriculum, which we are now calling competency-based curriculum, is to say that we are trying to arm them now with the skills to start looking at technology, to start looking, in fact, we, we, we have different uh, uh, programs where we are seeing how we can train, we're training up our young people to get online work, for example. We're training them up to see how they can uh, uh, get additional skills because unfortunately our old curriculum was more or less based on, you know, you learn your history, your French, your, 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 your languages, and, uh, but, but no practical skills. So we have intensified sort of retraining under, under our technical schools, which we're expanding in order to give uh, our young people the practical skills that they may need to become self-employed be it as plumbers, be it as builders, as carpenters, et cetera, because these are the areas uh, on top of the technology side that have opportunity. And this is what we're trying to arm them with. And, 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 and we are, are, are very hopeful. Kenya is a young country. Africa is a young continent. Our future uh, uh, lies with these people. And that's why it becomes to me a great passion because at the end of the day, if we don't look after, and I keep telling this to all my colleagues, if we don't look after, if we don't plan for our young people, we are actually planning for disaster. So Thank it you, is Mr. imperative. President. Thank okay. you, Mr. President. I'm, I'm going to hand over to Ambassador Yard, but if I don't do this without asking a question that Gabriel Nagatu is demanding I ask, I'll be in huge trouble. So he wants to know, uh, you know uh, veteran of the African Development Bank, as of course you know, um, what are the chances for a revitalized East African community? And then I promise I will leave you alone. I strongly believe in it. Um, but I'll also be honest that we, 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 we are also facing uh, a, a, a tremendous challenges uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, there is also mistrust uh, and other such issues. And this is a, a part of my own belief that um, we need to be able to overcome some of these challenges. And the only way to actually overcome them is by bringing ourselves together. You know, the mistakes that occurred in the 70s and the 60s and that led to the dissolution of, 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 of the old East African community some of those suspicions still simmer. And, 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 and I have been on, on the front line, always of trying to say that we can't live in the past, but we can learn from our mistakes of the past. Let's be able to move forward. And that's why Negatu knows he was in Nairobi when, you know, under the auspices of the AU, we have all these different border commissions. We met up with the prime minister of uh, Ethiopia in Moyale, where 
we uh, started cross-border uh, uh, initiatives aimed at encouraging those communities that live on the border to, 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 to be able to create. Uh, at that stage, we were actually calling Moyale the Dubai of, uh, of, 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 of Africa, trying to open up new transport corridors. We've done the same. We visited uh, recently with President Museveni in Uganda, again, trying to bring those border communities together. How do they share resources that they see in common? Because these are the same people on the Ugandan side, on the, on, on the, on the Kenyan side. All these different efforts aimed at trying to remove suspicions, aimed at getting all of us to understand that we are stronger together than we are apart. Thank you for that parting note. I'm handing over now to Ambassador Yard uh, with very, very many thanks. Thank you. Um, Excellency Kenyatta, Katrina Obre, thank you for that insightful discussion. I'm Ambassador Ramayad, and on behalf of the Af Africa Center and the Atlantic Council, I would also like to sincerely thank President Kenyatta for taking the time to speak with us and for choosing to return to the Atlantic Council's platform. Um, um, as His Excellency and Mrs. Manson uh, discussed, Kenya is faced by both a series of challenges and uh, opportunities as Africa and the world confront uh, the pandemic, we will continue to look uh, to leaders like President Kenyatta uh, for their action and engagement. Um, yet the conversation reminds us that uh, these same action, engagement and willingness to cooperate will be just as important once the coronavirus subsides. Um, it is a, a testament uh, to Kenya and to President Kenyatta that he that the country has continued to look past its borders and uh, beyond the crisis during this period of uncertainty, uh, moving forward on initiatives, including the US-Kenya FTA and a campaign to represent Africa on the UN Security uh, Council. As a Senegalese person and a French person, I have learned a lot. Uh, you have not only spoken as a Kenyan president, but also as a Pan-African leader. Um, the Atlantic Council sincerely hopes this upcoming period uh, will be one in which the United States uh, strengthens its ties with uh, Africa. And uh, it is comforting to know that uh, Kenya is one of the strategic partners that the United States is betting on in this endeavor. Um, as for the, the, the audience, uh, to wrap up this iteration for AC front page, I invite you to join the Arctic Council next week for another episode featuring executive vice president of the, of the European uh, Commission, um, Margaret Vestager, on Tuesday, June 23 at 10 a.m. Thank you and we'll see you next time. <laughs>